My name is Sarah Cook and I'm a mathematician and I work at the University of Michigan and my area of research is in complex dynamical systems. So today I'd like to tell you about a very famous fractal called the Mandelbrot set and a very famous sequence called the Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci, right over here, an Italian mathematician from the 12th century, uh, was the first to write down the Fibonacci sequence. So how is the Fibonacci sequence defined? We start with two numbers. F sub 0, the very first entry of the Fibonacci numbers, is a 1. We start with another number, F1, which is also a 1. And we generate the next number in the sequence by adding the two previous ones together. So the next number, F sub 2, will be the sum 1 plus 1 or 2. In general, here's the formula for the nth Fibonacci number. It's just the sum of the previous two in the list. So if you follow this recipe, starting with 1 and 1, you get a 2, and then 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8, you generate this infinite sequence of numbers. When you have the Fibonacci numbers, you can write down a geometric object that's associated to something called a Fibonacci spiral. So for each one of these numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, I want to place a square in this picture in the following way. So we take the first Fibonacci number, which is a 1, and I'm going to draw a square right here of side length 1. And then on top of that little square, I'm going to take the next Fibonacci number, which is also a 1, and draw a square of side length 1 stacked right on top of it. Then I'm going to take the next Fibonacci number, which is 2, and draw a square of side length 2 so that the side of this square, which is 2, touches the side of this square, which is 1, and the side of this square, which is 1. So now, in fact, I can generate the Fibonacci sequence from just this picture instead of looking at the numbers here on the bottom. So the next thing I would do is I would take this square of side length 2 and one of my original squares of side length 1, 1 plus 2 is 3, I would add in a square of side length 3 right there. Then over here I want to place a square. How big should that square be? Well, I want this square, one edge of the square, to be of length 3 plus 1 plus 1. So this square should have side length 5. So we'll draw it in right there. Then I want to place a new square. What side length should that square have? Well, it should be 5 plus 1 plus 2. So that square should have side length 8, and so on. And you continue in this geometric way by tiling the plane with squares, and the side lengths of the squares will give you the Fibonacci sequence. If you start in the corner of the very first square you placed and draw a spiral that goes through all of the corners, sort of the diagonal corner from this one, and then up here, and then down here, and then through the diagonal again, and through the diagonal corner here, and then through the diagonal corner here, and then here, and then here, and so on, you'll get a spiral. And this is called the Fibonacci spiral. Fibonacci, the Fibonacci numbers are very closely related to something called the golden ratio in mathematics. Okay, so look at this picture, and then consider the following rectangle over here. So we want to draw a rectangle that has side length A, and then the other side of the rectangle is A plus B. And I want to choose A and B in such a way that the following holds. That the large rectangle, whose side length is A plus B, and then A, is similar to this smaller rectangle that's shaded in pink here with side length A and B. That sets up an equation like this for me. And then if I impose the condition that, say, B is equal to 1, I get an equation. So I've substituted phi for a and 1 for b in this equation, and I want to look at the kinds of numbers that I get, satisfying this geometric condition that the large rectangle is similar to this smaller rectangle. Okay, That gives me this equation here, and then if I solve this for phi, that gives me a quadratic equation, which I can solve with a quadratic formula, and I find that there are two roots to this quadratic equation. One of them is positive and the other one is negative. We're interested in the positive root because we want to think of this as the side length for this rectangle. 
This number phi is called the golden ratio, and this special rectangle that has this geometric property is called the golden rectangle. And in fact, it's kind of a neat phenomenon that if you look at the ratio of successive Fibonacci numbers, 3 over 2, then 5 over 3, then 8 over 5, then 13 over 8, and so on, and you take the limit, so you go way far out in the sequence, that in fact that ratio will be equal to this golden ratio. And you can kind of convince yourself about why that's true with this geometric procedure for generating the Fibonacci numbers with rectangles over here, and then how the golden ratio was defined with this rectangle over there. Okay. So this golden spiral and these Fibonacci numbers show up all the time in nature. So for instance, hurricanes often have a spiral that looks like a golden spiral. Shells, the shapes of shells, galaxies. And in fact, the golden rectangle is very visually appealing. And so many sculptures and objects of art that humans have made have this sort of same ratio. It's something that's naturally appealing about it. The Mona Lisa is secretly inside of a golden rectangle. Even the human ear, you can find these ratios in the human ear, and in pineapples and flowers, trees. So the Fibonacci numbers are sort of everywhere. And in fact, they're also in fractals. So I want to tell you how to find the Fibonacci sequence, and in fact, the golden ratio in this picture. This is the Mandelbrot set. It's a very famous fractal. So before we find the Fibonacci numbers in there, I want to first tell you what it is. This is an object that arises in dynamical systems. Let me tell you exactly how. So what we're going to do is think of a polynomial, like for instance, f of z equals z squared, where z I want to think of as a complex variable. So I want to think of this polynomial as taking a complex number z and returning z squared. Because the domain and range are the same for this function, I can plug the number z into the function once, get z squared back, and then take that output and then plug it back into the function again. So this generates a sequence of numbers. For instance, if the point, which I'll label z0 here, is 0, if I plug that into the function once, I get 0 squared, which is just 0. If I take that output and plug it into the function again, I get 0 squared, which is just 0. So this generates a sequence. The sequence is a little boring in this case, but it's just a sequence of zeros. The point 0 is left fixed or unchanged by this function. It's called a fixed point. I can change the initial point where I start. So now I can start at the point 1 and see what happens to it when I plug it into this polynomial many, many times. So we take 1, we plug it into the function z squared, we get 1 squared back. We take 1 squared, which is just 1, plug it into the function, we get 1 squared back. So again, this is kind of a boring sequence. It's just a sequence of 1s. 1 is also a fixed point of this function. But things can get a little more interesting if you pick some other numbers. So since we're working with the complex numbers, I'll pick the number i. If you take i and plug it into this function, you get i squared or minus 1 back. Okay, then you take minus 1, you square it, you get 1 back. Okay, so if you start with this initial point, you will eventually get a sequence with all 1's here. i is not a fixed point, but i squared and then squared again will land you on the number 1, which is a fixed point. So after just two steps, this sequence is constant and boring again. What if we take 2? We square it, we get 4, we square that, we get 16, we square that, we get 256, then we get a big number, then we get a bigger number, then we get an even bigger number. So if you start with 2 and you do this procedure of taking the output and then feeding it back into the function, you'll get a sequence of numbers, but this time this sequence will get bigger and bigger and bigger and shoot off to infinity. Okay, so what we want to do is understand the behavior of this function, how the behavior of these sequences changes depending on the initial starting guess that you have. We can already see some different behaviors in this list. Okay, so one thing we might want to do is take a copy of the complex plane right here and color it according to the behavior of those sequences. For instance, 
I might take the point 0, which is in the center of this picture. I know what happens if I take 0 as my z0 and feed 0 into this function over and over again. I get that sequence that was just zeros. So I want a recipe for coloring this picture. And perhaps a good recipe is color a point in the plane black if the associated sequence does not shoot off to infinity. So if we use that recipe, then we get this picture. This is the closed unit disk. 0 is here, and it's colored black because the associated sequence was just 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. It did not shoot off to infinity. The point 1 is right here. It is also colored black because the associated sequence did not shoot off to infinity. The point 2 is probably over here. That is not colored black because the associated sequence did shoot off to infinity. So now we can look at a new example. Instead of z squared, we can look at z squared minus 1. And we can do the same thing. Color a point black if and only if the associated sequence that you get does not shoot off to infinity. Now this is a little bit harder to understand. We could start making a list like we did before. What happens if you start at 0? What happens if you start at 1? What happens if you start at i? What happens if you start at 2? And write down these sequences and use them to figure out what different colors we should use to color those points in. So if you do this recipe, you'll get this fractal. So you get this beautiful picture. 0 is here in the center. Minus 1 is here. 1 is here. And again, a point is colored black if and only if when you start at that point as, as your initial guess, the associated sequence does not shoot off to infinity. Just a remark, these pictures were drawn with a program called Fractal Stream, which you can find online if you Google that word. It's free, but I think only runs on Macs. OK, so here are different kinds of pictures that you get when you change the function that you start looking at. So for every single different quadratic polynomial, every single new polynomial that I could put up here, I'll get an associated picture. It'll have some black points and some purple points. And again, the black points are precisely those points, so that if you started there and fed that complex number into your function, took the output, fed it into the function, took that output, fed it into the function, that sequence that you get would be bounded, would not go off to infinity. You get very, very different shapes. And we might ask, well, how do we understand the different shapes that we get according to the different polynomials we have? Here's another example, which might be a little hard to see. So this is for the polynomial z squared minus 2.5. This looks a little bit different. There are black points in this picture, but in fact, it's a cantor set. That is, there's a dust of points here. It's very hard to see the black points. So many, many points are colored purple, which means if you start at any of those purple points, the associated sequence that you get will shoot off to infinity. So this black set here has many, many different pieces. It looks different from this set here, which appears to just be in one piece. Similarly, this set that we saw looks like it's just in one piece. And then we have our first example, the disk, which is just in one piece. So already the different kinds, the number of pieces that this set is in might be a little mysterious. We might ask, well, when is it connected? When is there just one piece? And when is it not? That's a question we might ask. For which polynomials, z squared plus some complex number, is this a connected set? And when is it not? OK, so here's a gallery of the shapes that we've seen so far. We looked at this example, this one, this one, and this one. This shape is just the flip of this shape. It's just the complex conjugate of it. OK. So all of these black sets, they have a name. The name of these sets, these are called filled Julia sets for the polynomials. Okay, and remember, each polynomial gives you a different picture. OK. So all the polynomials we were looking at were of the form z squared plus c, where c is some complex number. We want to think of c as something called a parameter. So now we have a copy of the complex plane here that we would like to color according to the shape 
of the filled Julia set, or the black set, for the polynomial z squared plus c. So think about this plane as being made up of a bunch of little, little c values, a bunch of complex numbers, so that each one of them gives you a new polynomial, and then that polynomial gives you a picture of a black fractal set, the filled Julia set. And we want to color this copy of the plane that contains these parameters c, we want to color it according to the shape or according to how the shape of that black fractal set changes. OK. So we're going to color a point black if and only if the associated Phil Julia set is in one piece, is connected. When we do that, we get this picture. This is the Mandelbrot set. OK. And let me just show you a little bit about the Mandelbrot set. So. Unfortunately, this little box on the right is very small. As I move around in the Mandelbrot set, you'll see the Phil Julia sets. So this is a C value that I've got. I look at the polynomial z squared plus c, and I plot the Phil Julia set over here in this box. So you can see how that shape changes according to how you move around here. So if it's in the Mandelbrot set, if the cursor's in the Mandelbrot set, the Phil Julia set, which is on the right over there, is connected. And as soon as you leave the Mandelbrot set, the Phil Julia set disconnects. Okay. So in fact, if I take a parameter like this one, I get this as my Phil Julia set. And then I can look and see what happens here as we iterate. So now I have the Phil Julia set, and I take a point that's in the black is my initial starting guess. And this output is what I get when I take this point and plug it into z squared plus c for this particular value of c that's giving me this picture. And for this example, it looks like there's a cycle of period 3 associated to this picture. We can go back and do that again. We can try this parameter here. We get a different shape. There's a cycle of period 2 associated to this parameter. Oops. So in fact, every single bulb that grows off of this heart-shaped region has an integer associated to it. This one has the integer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 associated to it. So there are those integers here. And in fact, if you look at this one and this one, between these two bulbs, there's a, a next largest one in size. The integer associated to this bulb is 3. The integer associated to this bulb is 2. Take 3 plus 2, you get 5, which turns out to be the integer associated to this bulb. 5 plus 3, you'll get the integer associated to the next largest one between them. 5 plus 3 is 8. That's the integer associated to this bulb. 8 plus 5 is 13, you'll get the integer associated to this bulb. So the Fibonacci numbers, the Fibonacci sequence, is hiding in the Mandelbrot set. And in fact, the golden ratio is also. Because there's a way to not only associate an integer to every bulb, but in fact a fraction, a rational number, that comes from the shape of the Phil Julia set. So this bulb has shape 1 third associated to it. This bulb has shape 1 half. If you just decide to add fractions straight across the top and straight across the bottom, you'll get 1 plus 1 on top, which is 2, 3 plus 2 on the bottom, which is 5. So the fraction that you get for this bulb, which is the largest one between this and this, is 2 fifths. The fraction that you get for the next largest bulb that's between here and here is 2 plus 3, 2 plus 1 is 3, 5 plus 3 is 8, which is this one. And you can continue. And in fact, these fractions are ratios of successive Fibonacci numbers, which means the golden ratio is hiding in here in the Mendelbrot set somewhere. So right about here is where it is. And what's so special about that complex number, that value of c in the Mandelbrot set? Well, 
there's something called the golden Ziegel disc. You get a very exotic shape for your filled Julia set. Remember, this is the filled Julia set for z squared plus c, where c corresponded to that golden ratio point on the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. And this is an exotic object, and I'll show you how exotic here. So here's a picture that the computer is drawing in real time, and you can see that it has sort of this area where the sequence associated is starting at this point is sort of just wrapping around. It looks like a rotation that has to do with the geometry of the golden mean. And I'll stop there. <laughs>